Uh, welcome to week three. Thank you very much for being here and, uh, and participating. Um, and uh, for the Simpatico users who are not able to get the emails, I apologize. I wish there was something I could do about it. Um, but I've tried all the different tricks that I know and have not succeeded. Um, so best bet would be if you have the option of um, sending me um, a different email address, that would be great. Someone wrote in the chat that maybe if you send me an email, um, that would show that, you're one, that I'm one of your contacts. You can try that. I, I'm not so sure that that'll work, but it's worth a shot. Um, and the best would be if you had the means of whitelisting my address or something along those lines, but I'm not sure that that's an option with Simpatico. Um, Okay, that was one note. Second note, um, I've mentioned the, the possibility of adding weeks um, because you know, we, we spent a lot of time on just you know, background and there's so much more to, to talk about. So I wouldn't add July 1st. Um, my Beit Midrash actually has a program that morning, a canada a learning program, which maybe I'll send out the information about that for anyone who wants to participate that morning. Um, and that program does not require any registration. It's just you log in that morning. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll send the links for that when I do the follow-up email for anyone who's not on Simpatico at any rate. Um, and then, uh, and then, if I do expand, it'll be starting July eighth, and maybe we'll uh, we'll do that. There's certainly a lot that I was hoping to get to in this series that we just haven't uh, haven't gotten to, and we're already um, on week three. So stay tuned. I, I do expect to send out information about it uh, if I'm adding, um, and uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see. All right, so. I'm not going to go back over everything we've talked about already because we've talked about quite a bit. But you know, the highlights are um, the main reasons people came to the New World in the first place, and Jews. Since we're talking about uh, the rabbis in the New World, why did the uh, the Jews come out? <coughs> excuse me, to the New World. I'm just going to add in the link again in the chat for those who want to get the source sheet. So the source sheet is linked there for anyone who didn't get it in my email. Um, we talked about Jews coming to avoid persecution, as well as migrating within the New World to avoid persecution, in particular as the Portuguese conquered areas that had previously been Dutch. So you find them migrating around, most famously ending up in New York when the Portuguese uh, take Recife in Brazil. Um, we also talked about the economic opportunity and how Jews were in a good position to be able to capitalize on that opportunity. We briefly discussed um, Jewish life in the New World, uh, in the area that would later become Canada. So uh, two notes. One, Anne noted to me that uh, she was actually the editor of a book called Esther uh, by Sharon McKay. And that book is about Esther Brandeau, who I mentioned last time, uh, is the first identified Jew to be in, the, uh, in, in what would become Canada. And she has a very fascinating story, uh, including apparently uh, masquerading as a male uh, when she uh, came over to, uh, to this area. So that's something that you may want to look into. Um, the, other, the other note was uh, somebody emailed me some fascinating information, some within the group, um, uh, about research done by a relative who was a postal historian uh, on um, letters being carried back and forth in that era among the fur traders and uh, the possibility that some of them just based on name uh, may actually have been Jewish and that would, uh, that would be a very interesting early Jewish presence um, and of course Jews ended up in the fur trade later but that's a different fur trade that's not that, that's not that kind of fur trade um, in any case, we talked about the first rabbis in the New World. We talked about Rabbi Yitzhak Abohab. We talked about the Pardo dynasty as well. Um, and we started talking about Jewish life in the New World, and specifically rabbi-led observances that were found in the New World. We talked about it being a Sephardic community primarily, although not exclusively. We noted that there's some debate about the level of, of observance that exists there, and we're going to come back to that more today. 
but in terms of rabbi-led practices, we talked about communal prayer and the, the early synagogues. And I think towards the end, we talked a little bit about the sand floor, which is a fun discussion. Um, but um, picking up from there, I think that's actually a good spot to, uh, to start. So worth noting, the American Jewish Archives actually has a ketubah from Suriname that's dated 1643. <clears throat> which is fascinating. A little bit controversial because the dating seems to be inaccurate on it, meaning the Hebrew date that's listed in the Ketubah, if you're familiar with the way Ketubah works, it begins with the day of the week and the date. So the Hebrew date that's on the Ketubah should be a Shabbos. However, the Ketubah is dated with Tuesday. And in fact, we don't do weddings on, uh, on Shabbat traditionally. So that's a little bit odd in terms of understanding the dating on that Ketubah. It may simply be a mistake. Those things could happen, um, especially in a, uh, in a world like that. It's easy to envision. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, I also wonder a little bit. I don't remember anymore. I made this note about that Ketubah years and years ago. And I don't remember anymore whether whether I had accounted for the shift in the calendar that occurred in the 18th century, the, um, the whole calendar game um, with the Gregorian and Julian calendars, I don't think that it should have made a difference, but I wonder. Uh, I'd have to go back and take a look. But the, my point really in bringing it is not so much to challenge the validity of a 1643 Ketubah um, as it is to say, hey, they have a Ketubah there in, uh, in the colonies in 1643. That reflects a level of sophistication. But we are going to go way beyond that sophistication with the first source that you have on the source sheet from Mordechai Arbel. So Mordechai Arbel, somebody else had mentioned to me uh, in an email following the first session as a uh, remarkable historian of this period. Um, so he reports on a very interesting prenuptial agreement. Sorry. No, you didn't lose anything. We're here. The... Um, Remarked on a on a uh, on a remarkable prenuptial agreement, and in order to explain just how remarkable this is, I need to uh, mention a term which some of you may be familiar with, called yibum, and a related term that some of you may be familiar with, called chalitza. Under biblical law, in the event, God forbid, that uh, a man or woman are married and then the husband passes away and there are no children, there is a mitzvah for the man's brother to marry his widow. That's the mitzvah called yibum. You find it in the Torah even before the Torah is given at Sinai. It was actually a, um, a, a pre-Sinai practice. Ramban, Nachmanides, says it was called Geulah beforehand. And the idea um, really seems to have two components to it. Number one, continuing the name of the brother who passed away. And number two, taking care of the widow. Because it would historically have been difficult for her to be able to marry again. And so this way, she gets married to somebody within the family, and keeping in mind that back in the day, polygamy was okay. Um, the, uh, it didn't disrupt existing, well, it may disrupt existing relationships, but it didn't prevent um, other marriages from taking place. It was a way to take care of the widow within the family. This was called yibum in the, uh, in the Torah. But what if she is not interested in marrying her deceased husband's brother. She never liked him in the first place. They, um, or what if he isn't interested in marrying her? So there is a ritual called chalitza, in which, among other things, she removes the shoe of the man who was supposed to do yibum. That's a whole meaningful ritual in its own right. If you look at commentaries to the book of Ruth, you may find discussion of it there. Um, she actually spits at him and declares this is what is done to somebody who will not build up the house of his brother. The, um, even though she could be the one to trigger Chalitza by refusing the marriage, nonetheless, that's the, uh, that's the ritual. Now, let's say the following horrific thing happens, and it has happened from time to time in Jewish history. A man and a woman are married, and the husband dies, and there are no children, and he has a brother, but the brother lives far away. Now what happens? She's stuck. She's supposed to either marry her brother, 
or have her brother-in-law or do this uh, this chalitza ritual and she doesn't have the option of doing either one or what happens if they're not really far away however the brother who um, is supposed to do this chalitza says you know what I'm not interested I'm not going to cooperate now what do you do so there are things that can be done, and in fact, this you know this has happened historically, and there's a lot of literature on dealing with this. But take a look with that in mind. It's source number one from the Encyclopedia of Jewish Women, the article Caribbean Islands and the Guianas. This is available online. I gave you the link there, so that uh, those who want and those who have the digital version of well, I guess everyone has the digital version of the source sheet. Um, we're not handing out hard copies, so you can just click on the link and you'll be taken to the article. Look at this. A special custom prevalent in the Caribbean area was a prenuptial agreement called Shtar Chalitza. Shtar means document. So a document of Chalitza. According to Jewish law, a husband's brother has to marry his widowed sister-in-law if she was left childless. And it goes on to explain this, uh, this ritual that I just discussed. So he talks about what happens if he refuses to gauge in this, to take a look at the second paragraph, to prevent this situation, in the Caribbean, the groom's brother gave the bride at the marriage ceremony in writing a letter granting her chalitza in case of the death of his brother. The wording taken from an actual example from Kingston, Jamaica in 1824 was as follows. The woman Esther, wife of my brother Uri, should hold it as proof that I have consented of my own free will, that if Esther will have need of chalitza, I am obligated to free her of a valid chalitza. And goes on to give the provenance of this, uh, of this letter. Now, the, um, the, I should correct something that our bail writes here. The letter is not granting her chalitza from before the marriage. There's no such thing. The, uh, but what he's doing is he's pledging his cooperation with chalitza if it should come to that. That's what this actually is, as you can see in the text itself. If she will have need of it, I am obligated to dot, dot, dot. That's the, uh, that's the idea. But the, the, uh, the fact that they're doing this is fascinating. I'm not sure how early it was, because the document they bring here is 1824. Um, but our bail in general is going back to colonial times. It reflects a degree of sophistication if they're actually doing that. Chalitza is relatively rare as a, uh, as a phenomenon, right? Consider that. It requires that. The uh, number one it requires the husband pass away. Number two, it requires that there be no children. And number three, it also requires that uh, that there be a brother. So all of those, you know, lead to this being a relatively rare um, occurrence. Ian has a question. He's got his hand up. Yes. After after Khalitza? Yes. Nope. That's it. One shot. Now the truth of the matter is, I should also note that this is no longer yibum, the idea of them marrying is no longer considered an acceptable option um, in the Jewish world as a whole. I do believe there are Spartac communities where it's still done. But going back to the Talmud, the, um, no ch- um, there's a, a question in the chat, no children or no male children, the answer is no children at all, meaning if there's a son or a daughter, then this isn't done. Um, but sorry, going back to, uh, going back to Ian's question and my spin from his question, the, um, there was something already back in the Talmudic times in which one of the sages, I think it was Abba Shaul, said that people really shouldn't do Yibum unless they're doing it for the right reasons. Meaning this isn't meant to be that the, uh, the brother-in-law and, uh, and sister-in-law are, uh, you know, are admiring each other for years and now this is their opportunity to get married. That's not the idea. The idea is the two purposes that I mentioned before, the, the goal of carrying on the name of the deceased brother and the goal of taking care of the widow. Okay. Um, I had a note someone sent me asking if the shoe has anything to do with divorce. I don't believe so. I'm not familiar with anything that would connect it to, uh, to divorce. Okay. Um, going back to the larger picture of what we're talking about here, um, not every community at this time had a, uh, a rabbi. Um, some communities had a chazan, a cantor, 
um, some had neither. However, we also find that you had shochtim, people carrying out ritual slaughter. You had bodkin, people who are responsible to check and make sure everything was done right with the slaughter. And you had malalim, people who did a, 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 a circumcision um, as well. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the example of Suriname specifically. But I wanted to also address a question which someone sent me after the first week because it's a fun question and this way we'll get into at least a little bit of the discussion about kosher food in the colonies. And that's the question of how Jews came to eat turkey. Why in the world is, or why in the new world, is turkey a kosher bird? This is a really, really good question. So a little bit of background. How do you know whether a bird is kosher at all? And don't tell me if it has the, uh, you know, the stamp from the OU or something else on it, then I know it's kosher. How do you know that any species of bird is a kosher bird? What are the, uh, what are the identifying items? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a good start. So the answer really has to begin when you look at the biblical text. The Torah discusses the laws of kashrut, the laws of kosher and non-kosher species, twice. Once in the Torah portion of Shemini, found in Leviticus, roughly chapter 11. It's either chapter 9 or chapter 11. And then the other is in Deuteronomy in, uh, in the portion called Re'eh. And that will be somewhere around uh, chapter 14 in, uh, in Deuteronomy. So, the, uh, so there, the Torah does a very odd thing. Instead of listing the kosher species of birds, and instead of listing any sort of characteristic for birds to identify them as kosher, it simply lists 24 species of non-kosher birds. In other words, unlike with animals, where we're told chew its cud and split hooves, or fish, we have the fins and scales, for birds, we're just told these species are not kosher. And that's it. Now, given that, I might have made the assumption that anything in the New World is automatically kosher. Because the Jews who received the Torah with those 24 species were in the Eastern Hemisphere. They wouldn't have known about a turkey in the Western Hemisphere, so turkey couldn't be on that list of non-kosher species, and that would be that. Not so simple. For a couple of reasons. First of all, a New World bird might be deemed a relative of a bird in the Old World. Species are uh, potentially related. That's number one. Number two, since traditionally we understand the Torah is divine, you could have a New World species on its list. The fact that Moses and the, uh, and the Jews wouldn't have heard of it doesn't prevent God from hearing of it. They, in fact, there's always been confusion about what some of those species are that are mentioned there in the Torah. I should note, parenthetically, I keep using the word species. It's really the wrong word. I only use it because it's the only word we have. Um, meaning... Technically, when we say species, we're talking about a scientific taxonomy of relatives. However, the Torah's categories are not about their, their biological relatives. The, um, the Torah's the definition of a species is based on morphology, what the thing looks like. The, uh, so, so you can't really use the word species at all, but there, I don't have another word for it that, that, that won't be clumsy. So that's the word we use is species. But in any case, given that I can't just say everything in the new world is fine because it's not on that list of 24, somebody wrote in the chat, maybe I mean family, but no, I, I don't even mean family because family also is based on that taxonomy, right? You have that whole hierarchy, the genus, the family, the species, and so on. I don't remember the acronym anymore. The, um, but the, what do I do? How do I identify it? So the Talmud gives us signs for kosher birds, some of which some of you have mentioned. The Talmud gives three physical signs and a trait. Three physical signs. It has to, in order to be kosher, it has to have a crop. It has to have a gizzard that you can peel back. And it has to have an extra toe. Those are your three physical traits. We're not going to go into the details right now, the, uh, but those are the three physical characteristics, I should say. And then the trait, and this has been noted by a couple of people here, is that it's not predatory. 
But that's not the term the Talmud uses. The Talmud's your term is that it is not dorace. To be dorace is to trample something. And that's why people think of it as being predatory. But it's more complicated than that. There's a lot of debate about what exactly that means. And in fact, how we determine the various signs and which of those signs are actually requirements. The result of that is what I brought you in source number two. Take a look at this. This is from the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. First, Rabbi Yosef Karo, who was writing the original Code of Jewish Law in 16th century Tzfat. He was originally from Turkey, different Turkey. Well, maybe not different. We'll talk about that. But uh, he was originally from Turkey, and then he ended up in Tzfat in Israel. And look what he says. A kosher bird may be eaten based on a tradition, meaning that it is obvious to people there that this is a kosher bird. In other words, to avoid the whole debate of, well, does it have an extra toe? Does it not have an extra toe? What kind of gizzard is it? Does it trample? Does it not trample? Forget it. If your grandmother said it was kosher and her grandmother said it was kosher, it's a kosher bird. That's it. We're done. And then he goes into the signs, and he says, and, I underlined it for you, if it is, not, if it is known not to be do-race, if we know for sure that it doesn't do that trampling thing, then there are three signs of a kosher bird. In other words, you have to have that it's not trampling its prey. And then look at these three signs. Extra toe, crop, and a gizzard that can be peeled by hand. But even if it has these three signs, don't eat it. We're concerned that it might be do race. In other words, that's a first requirement. Having those three signs doesn't help. Unless, again, they have a tradition from their ancestors that it's kosher. Then a last note. This is known as the goose test. Geese are not do race. They're not these kinds of predators. They can't. So, some say that if a bird has a broad beak and the sole of its foot is broad like that of a goose, meaning it's got like webbed feet, then it is known not to be dorace. One may eat it if it has the, the aforementioned three physical signs. That was what Rabbi Yosef Caro wrote. So he gives you the signs, and he says, but really, if you've got a tradition, you're much better off. How do you spell dorace? In Hebrew, dalid vav resh samach. Oh, it is a, I wouldn't know if it was a tough one. Yeah, it's a Sama. Okay. Along comes Rabbi Moshe Israelis in source number three, and he hardens up the idea of requiring a tradition. And this is really, really important, as you'll see. He's writing in Krakow, a little bit after Rabbi Yosef Karo. He says, some say one should not rely even on this, meaning the comparison to a goose. One should not eat any bird without a tradition that it is kosher. This is the practice. One should not deviate from it. So, if I need a tradition that the bird is kosher, if I need to know my grandmother ate it and her grandmother ate it and her grandmother ate it, well, how in the world did you start eating turkey? You show up in the new world and believe it or not, there were no Jewish grandmothers. <laughs> they definitely sent letters with you, but that's about it. They, uh, and no doubt they complained when you didn't write back. Rabbi? Yes. Right. So I didn't want to go into the the, uh, the further the further possibility. There are a couple of other signs that are possible, and one of them, well, two of them really are egg related. You are correct. One being the shape of the egg, and the other the structure of the yolk and the albumin inside. I just figured I was confusing people enough. But uh, but you are correct that there are egg signs as well. They will not be dispositive. The the signs that we've given so far would actually work. The egg signs are sort of an attachment to. If you want, if you really would like to know more about it, I would recommend, um, in source number four, I referenced an article by Rabbi Ari Zivotovsky called Is Turkey Kosher? That's a pretty good and thorough article where he goes through much more about this, and you can find it online. There's a website called kashrut.com, which will show up if you Google Is Turkey Kosher and Zivotovsky. Make sure you spell his last name correctly. The, um, then you'll get, uh, you'll get to that website, and they have his article there on the site, and you can read it there. But what, um, what Rabbi Zivotovsky goes through to try to understand how Turkey could have been declared kosher is, first of all, he brings a bunch of arguments that people have brought 
that are, that are unacceptable arguments. So one argument is, well, the turkey has the physical signs of kosher birds. And he says, that's all well and good, but we just read the Code of Jewish Law in source number two and source number three that wants a tradition that this bird is not deraced, this bird does not trample its prey. That's, that was one idea, but the idea that it had the kosher signs is challenging. A second idea is fascinating. You find in some of the literature, the Jewish law literature, going back a couple of centuries, that they thought Jews did have a tradition for Turkey. Tell me something. When explorers first landed in the New World, where did they think they had landed? India, correct. So there were people who thought that the Turkey was actually from India and that the Jews living in India had a tradition that it was a kosher bird. As a matter of fact, we call the bird Turkey, but a lot of people called it an Indic. That was a name that people had for it, that people still have for it, I should know. So that was a second theory. The problem is, it's not from India. So that's not, that, doesn't, that doesn't help us. Um, there's a third theory, which is a fascinating, fascinating idea. If you notice the sources I brought you in 2 and 3 from the Code of Jewish Law, those are recorded in the 16th century. So some suggest... There are already explorers in the New World, and Jews already have access to Turkey before the Code of Jewish Law is written. So maybe there are Jews who are eating turkey before the Code of Jewish Law says you need a tradition in order to label it as a kosher bird. They were grandfathered in, so to speak. The flaw in that idea, while it's true that there were Jews eating turkey before this, as we're going to see, the flaw in that idea is that the idea of a tradition for birds did not originate with the code of Jewish law. Rashi mentions it already back in the, uh, in the 11th century. It's not new with the code of Jewish law. So the code of Jewish law codifies it, but it's an old idea. So how is it that we end up eating turkey? So four different arguments are, uh, are brought to, uh, to support the, the fact that, that, again, many Jews, in fact, do. Um, I will note, someone put in the chat requesting that people mute. And when I hear noises coming from unmuted things, I'll, I'll mute everybody as well. But yes, unless you have a question, it's a good idea to stay on mute. I would, I would second that. Okay, so what are the possibly valid arguments? I brought them for you in bullet points in source number four. One possibility is that even though the Code of Jewish Law said we need a tradition, the fact is that the Code of Jewish Law is relying on Rashi's argument that we need a tradition, and there were always those who disagreed. The answer could be the Code of Jewish Law lost. It's good enough to have the signs that we have, and you don't need a tradition. That's one approach. A second approach is that if the bird has, if you look back at the structure of what Rabbi Kara wrote in source number two, if a bird has those three signs he mentioned, the extra toe, the crop, and the gizzard, the peelable gizzard, and we observe that it's not dough race, it doesn't trample, that's good enough, because I've got all of these signs, and the people there could tell. Sorry, Margaret? We might as well just leave it and he does record it. Who does record what? I don't understand. Oh, now I understand. The, I'm just muting. Okay. So the, um, the, the third possibility is that Turkey was viewed, and this is what someone had written to me, that Turkey was viewed as part of the chicken clan. It's just a big chicken. Now, I thought about bringing on the source sheet a picture of a live turkey and a picture of a live chicken. It's really, really hard to confuse the two. You know, turkey and chicken are, are, are substantively different. I remember the first time that I saw a, uh, a turkey. I was, uh, when I was a rabbi in Pennsylvania, I visited uh, a, a member of the synagogue who lived uh, on a lake in the middle of nowhere. It's called Lake Nakamixon, for anybody who knows eastern Pennsylvania. And I'm driving there, and I had just gotten a cell phone. It was, you know, back in the day. The, um, and 
and and I'm driving and then suddenly I see this thing on the road <laughs> and I pull over and I call my wife and I said I don't know what I just saw it was a wild turkey I've been eating it for years but um, but no that doesn't look like a chicken in any way shape or form I mean it's got two legs but but the uh, but so do people the um, the truth of the matter is that they are remotely related not remote they are related um, someone had noted before family versus uh, versus species they are actually in the same family so that you know that that is indeed a uh, a possible argument and some argued that they were considered to be relatives Rabbi Zivotofsky himself offers a fourth possibility which is fascinating when you know the history the first people in Europe to eat turkey or I should say the first explorers to eat turkey well no I can't it's not correct not correct let me say it differently Jews likely ate turkey for the first time not when they came over with the explorers but in Europe because the earliest explorers brought back these birds to Europe the Spaniards brought them back and they ended up in Turkey hence the name Turkey so that Sephardic Jews living in Turkey and living perhaps as new Christians in the Iberian Peninsula would have been the first one to eat it you follow? they're eating turkey there and Spartac Jews had less allegiance to the idea that you need a tradition about the bird that's why I broke out sources 2 and 3 the way I did source number 3, Rabbi Moshe Isserlis is the leading Ashkenazi authority of his day and he says you need a tradition, that's the practice don't deviate from it however Rabbi Caro in source number 2 the leading Spartac authority while he does mention the idea of tradition seems to be more open to identifying the bird based on its signs so therefore the Spartac community starts eating it when it's brought over to Europe and that develops a tradition such that the Ashkenazim start eating it as well so this was a little bit of a deviation from the main history discussion but I think it's fascinating in terms of how you end up eating turkey um, the, um, somebody posted a note in the chat that Rabbi Zivotofsky is actually teaching a class for Torah in motion the, uh, starting uh, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. so you can see the link there thank you for putting that in the chat Chaim. Um, someone asked here did they distinguish turkey from turkey vultures absolutely turkey vulture is a different creature altogether the, uh, and not um, not related to this uh, yeah not, not related to this discussion that is uh, that is true um, Diane asks is this minagavotenu biadenu in a sense it is that's a bigger discussion and Mark notes as well that there are those who refrain this is absolutely true um, when I was in yeshiva in Israel after high school there were some British Jews there whose families still don't eat turkey which is ironic because Israel is actually one of the leading consumers of turkey in the world the, um, the, uh, if you go to Israel and you buy shawarma from a vendor odds are it's not lamb it's turkey the, um, Israel is one of the leading uh, consumers of turkey in the world in any case the, um, we're going to talk more if we do the extension into July I want to talk about the Muscovy duck which shows up in New Orleans in, uh, in the 18th, 19th century and that's a great story in its own right so maybe we'll come back to some of this then but to return to the main point it would be a myth to say that Jewish life in these colonies was weak or non-existent it was definitely there. We saw the Chalitza, we saw the, the Ketuba, we talked about the officiants you had, the rabbis who were there. On the other hand, religion was not a primary focus for these people. You don't find yeshivot developing. You find religious schools for children, the, uh, but you don't, you don't find a major religious infrastructure there. Now, on your sheet, I gave you review questions. This is not a test. 
the, um, you do not need to uh, answer it and send it to me and have me check your work. But I always feel like it's important to make sure we know something out of what we've been doing. Especially here, we've been learning together for two and a half hours. You know, I think we should make sure we know something out of it. So, which events made Europe an inhospitable and tumultuous place for Jews in the 16th and 17th centuries? So we talked about the expulsion from Spain and Portugal, the creation of the new Christian conversos. We talked about the Italian ghetto, Martin Luther, 30 years, the Thirty Years' War, the Hmelnitsky massacres, the Sabbatean disappointment from Shabtai Tzvi. Why were Jews well positioned to capitalize on the economic opportunity of exploration? So they had experience in international connections for commerce. The, um, and the countries that were into exploring, like Amsterdam, recognized the value of Jews. What was the attitude of 16th century European rabbis to exploration? They didn't really address it in their writings other than to express excitement about what was being discovered, and in particular the idea of reuniting missing tribes. Um, did learned rabbis go to the New World? At least some did, Rabbi Abu Hab being a prime example, some of the Pardo rabbis who we mentioned as well. Why might the Sephardim have been less observant than the Ashkenazim, as had been observed in New York? Um, so some, one reason would have been their life as conversos, as well as the turmoil of expulsion and the lack of historic grounded communities because they moved from place to place. Um, were there Jewish professionals, Jewish community professionals in the colonies? The answer is, you bet. The, um, the, the, you had the Chazanim, you had the Shochtim. And why did Jews accept Turkey as kosher? And we gave all those reasons just now so that I'm not going to review. Let's move into discussing Suriname. Yes, Susan. Um, last week, Diane, I looked up to try and find out if there were, Diane did actually, if there were Sephardic yeshivas. And she couldn't find that at this period there were Sephardic yeshivas yet. So maybe there were yeshiv, maybe they didn't set up yeshivas because Sephardic didn't... You're talking, about, you're talking about in Europe? Yes. Right, so the, so you didn't have, keep in mind, much of Sephardic Jewry, again, was very mobile at this stage. Mobile is kind of a, uh, a, a euphemism here. They were forced to move from place to place. They're not setting up institutions. You're not allowed to set anything up in Spain and in Portugal. And those who came to Turkey and Amsterdam likely did not feel that it was a safe thing to do. The, um, you know, keep in mind also the word yeshiva has different meanings in different times. Meaning, Jewish communities had opportunities for advanced learning in different ways. So what happens in Eastern Europe in the 19th century is different from what you would have seen in Eastern Europe at the end of the, uh, well, the middle of the 18th century. The um, things evolve. It's not straightforward. It's a longer discussion than we're going to have right now. But you had eras when you had sort of community Beit Midrash setups where people would just have a place where they would come to learn. And then you had at other times institutions that were actually even potentially their own community to which people went and students would go to learn. Like, it varies based on place and time. Okay. Suriname is one of the first Jewish communities. Actually, anybody have any questions here to, that, um, that you want to ask? Okay. For those who came in late, I'm going to put again the link for the source sheet in the chat. Um, and I'm also going to note something that I've been saying in previous weeks. If you're already on the email list, you don't need to sign up again. If you're on the email list and not receiving the emails, signing up again, unfortunately, isn't going to help. It, it's, it's just that it's not getting through. And, I, and my best recommendation would be, if you're not getting the emails, try to send me a different email address to use for you. And, uh, and that may help. I'm sorry to those who aren't getting it, um, especially because I know some of the people who aren't getting it actually even sent a donation for the course, which was very lovely of you, and I wish that I could get you the emails in some way. Okay, um, Suriname. Suriname is part of the major early colonial effort in the Caribbean. Think Barbados, Curacao, Jamaica. They're on the northern coast of South America by the Caribbean Sea. Um, Suriname is founded by the British under Lord Willoughby, governor of Barbados, in the 1650s. It's basically a place for his surplus population. 
He's got more people than he can keep in Barbados. So they go to Suriname. It was very attractive agriculturally. The Dutch got it in a treaty with the, uh, with the British in 1667. That's the same treaty in which they traded New York. So in other words, New York became British and Suriname became Dutch. I mean, there's more to it, but that's part of the, uh, of the deal. Um, England gets it back in 1799, but, uh, and then it's returned to the Dutch in 1816, ultimately not liberated from the Dutch until the 1970s, interestingly. What about the Jewish community? So the Jews there are, are there for a reason that's already familiar to us. They're running away from the Catholics. Um, many Jews fled the Inquisition in Europe to Dutch Brazil. We've talked about that. Um, and then when the Portuguese take over Brazil, they need to get out of, uh, of Brazil and find some other place controlled by the, uh, by the Dutch. In 1639, Jews from Holland and Italy um, settled in an English colony in the capital of Tororica in Suriname. They established uh, sugar plantations. More of them arrived from the Barbados. There's a whole thing going on in Europe at this point in the 1640s, 1650s, which we're not going to discuss, called the English Civil War or the War of Three Kings. And that's a mess. But because of the ramifications of that war, Jews actually come from Barbados, which was British, to Suriname in 1652, and they develop an area which I hope I'm not mispronouncing. Someone correct me if I am. It's called the Uden Savannah. Uden Savannah. The uh, the spelling is J O D E N S A V A N N E. The um, that's the uh, that's the spelling of it. I believe it's called Uden Savannah. I know we have. Sorry, Carney, what? Yodin Savannah. Okay, thank you. Yodin Savannah, not Yudin. Okay, I went looking online and I found the most absurd mispronunciations um, for it. I found um, the uh, the yeah. I, I found some terrible mispronunciations. Like even I could tell there were mispronunciations. The um, but Yodin Savannah is uh, is what I will use then. Um, in 1664. Jews flee French Guiana, and yes, I noticed the, um, from uh, Paula in the chat that Suriname at one point was known as Dutch Guinea. There are the three Guineas, the three Guianas. So Jews flee from the French area when the French take it from Holland, and then they go to Suriname instead under the leadership of a man by the name of David HaKohen and Nasi. And we're going to come back to the Nasi family because they are very important in this history. Um, the bottom line is that Jews end up in Suriname because they're running away from somewhere else. That's really what, uh, what it comes down to. So these were Spartac communities. They came from Spartac extraction from, uh, from Spain, from Portugal, from Amsterdam. And the settlers there see it as a second holy land, so to speak. Um, we've already noted that they gave their plantations and their settlements biblical names. So that in Suriname you find a Beersheba, Carmel, Machanayim, which reflects a real biblical knowledge. That's not one of those that everybody knows about. The um, Machanayim Machanayim is the place where, anybody know what happened in Machanayim? In biblical Machanayim. Yes, Chaim got it. So Machanayim is the place where Jacob encounters angels on his way back into the land of Israel after he's been away in the home of Lavan. He comes back with his family. So the, um, he comes to the place of Machanayim and he sees, uh, he sees camps of angels there. Machanayim meaning camps. There's another place called Dotan, which has biblical significance, Sukkot, another one, Moriah, Nahamu, Hebron, Ramah. They, um, so they clearly have, have awareness of their, uh, of their Tanakh, their Bible. Um, and the community itself has religious freedom. On August 17, 1665, the British colonial government granted the Jews freedom of religion, including the right to have a court that would run their own cases, so they had a, uh, a, a Beit Din. Um, they had a private civic guard. They had permission to build synagogues and schools. 
So they immediately start building schools as well as a wooden synagogue. Um, the, uh, the civic guard dedicated the synagogue in 1671. 1685, they built it as a brick synagogue and they named it Bracha V'Shalom, Blessing and Peace. Now, our Baal gives us a little bit of a census to work with. If you take a look at source number 5 from Mordechai Arbel's Encyclopedia of Jewish Women, he says, In 1694, the population of the Jewish Savannah totaled more than 570 Jews. He has employing about 9,000 laborers in 40 plantations. Now, the word laborers means what to you? Probably slaves. Yeah, yeah laborers means slaves. I call it for what it is. However, the 9,000 number is incorrect. The, um, I'll explain later where the number comes from, but the 9,000 number is simply wrong. Um, in the mid-18th century, 2,000 Jews in 115 plantations with tens of thousands of laborers. The Jews on the plantation were the owner, his wife and children, the overseer, not always Jewish, and the accountant. The others were plantation workers, usually salaried Indian workers or African slaves and house slaves. The owner's wife was customarily in charge of the house slaves and asked the question of maybe there could have been indentured servants. I don't find them mentioned in censuses, but I suppose it's possible there were some among them, but certainly not in large numbers. But I'm going to come back to the mistake why he has this number, which is incorrect. The... Um, the community, and here we come back to Carney's question from before, the community was run by something called a ma'amad. Literally, the Hebrew word ma'amad comes from what root? Anybody know? To stand, right, la'amod. It is the council of the town, and it did not include the rabbi. Take a look at source number six from the dissertation by Jonathan Schorsch. Someone um, asked early on today when this dissertation was actually published. I noted for you that it's been published in book form, although it's not as exhaustive as, uh, as the original dissertation. So I don't know. I do know that he sent me the dissertation when I was still in Rhode Island, and he, um, he was in my synagogue sometimes. So... Um, so that, I left Rhode Island in 2001, so it's sometime after 2001 that he published it, but honestly, I don't know when. Um, so he writes there, Richard Menkes, the historian, wrote that the Bordeaux Jewish, quote, community structure was controlled by a strong lay leadership, overshadowing clerical authority to a degree which probably surpassed even the strong lay influence in the Sparta community of Amsterdam. Brazil, Curaçao, or Suriname, London. I'm not sure what London was doing in there. I, I don't know if he meant London there. I think it might have been a mistake. The dissertation has a couple of typos in it. I'm not sure what that was doing there. None of the ma'amads of these communities included a rabbi who was always an employee of these boards. So the rabbi was an employee of the board. He didn't sit on the board. The Amsterdam Sparta community was, quote, run by the wealthiest 20% of the community, though it lacked the tight oligarchic control of the Bordeaux community. Now, obviously, Amsterdam, Bordeaux, you're in Europe, but this translates to the communities that they create within the, uh, within the colonies. The Mahmud's job included maintaining rabbinic norms, and they had the rabbi who was supposed to obviously help carry that out. The Jews of these communities were very eager to prove their patriotism, and that includes um, when you're dealing with um, the slaves. Take a look at source number seven, please, also from Shorsh. He quotes you a book called The Historical Essay on Suriname. I'm going to come back to the historical essay. It's going to matter a great deal shortly. The, um, but he's quoting it right now. What you need to know right now is that it's written in the latter half of the 18th century by Jews who lived in, in Suriname. So, hence the historical essay on Suriname included in its description of a successful 1743 anti-Maroon expedition of Captain, D of Captain David Cohen Nasi. Well, you know what? I need to pause. I should have explained before. Anybody know what a Maroon was? So a Maroon was a slave who ran away. It's a word that has cognates in French as well as in local languages 
from the colonies. So the um, so this is an anti-Maroon expedition. It's an expedition against runaway slaves. So they talk about this expedition in 1743 of Captain David Kohane Nasi. David Kohen Nasi, we mentioned the Nasi family before, the very prominent family. So they write that the enemies were attacked on the day of Kippur, or of atonement of the Jews. And without any regard for this sacred day, he pursued the enemies, set fire to their cabins, utterly ruined the village, tore out of the ground the roots of their victuals, took 14 prisoners, and killed a large number. So it's describing how David Kohen Nasi pursues them and does all of this on Yom Kippur. So this is brought as evidence of the Jews trying to ingratiate themselves to the larger population there. However, I have to note that there may be a mistake in reading this. Notice the beginning of the quote. The enemies were attacked on the day of Kippur. So you could read that as the slaves, the Maroons, were attacked on the day of Kippur. But I don't think so. Based on the flow of the sentence, and based on the fact that it has always been a popular Jewish thing to write euphemistically, when we talk about ourselves being attacked, we say the enemies were attacked. It's a euphemism. We don't want to describe ourselves being attacked. If you go back to the beginning of the biblical book of Shemot, the book of Exodus, the um, Pharaoh says, the Venosaf um, hu al Sona'inu, the, um, the term Sona'inu, our enemies, is often used as a euphemism to refer to, to ourselves when we don't want to. So in other words, what this might actually be saying is, we were attacked on the day of Kippur. That that's what happened. And therefore, we responded in this way. Something worth, uh, worth noting. I suspect that's the original intent. Either way, they're definitely, um, they're definitely pursuing this on, the, uh, on, on Yom Kippur. And to address the comment in the quote from Albert that the word being used the second time is inconsistent, that's not inconsistent at all. Meaning you would use the word sone euphemistically to refer to yourself and then to refer to the enemy in the same sentence. And, and that happened. I, I don't view that as an inconsistency here. That was the way it was done. The, I'm going to come back to this um, historical essay in a little bit. But you certainly had Jewish practices in Suriname. Um, we have a record of their library, their Jewish library in 1739, which included a few volumes of the Talmud, the Code of Jewish Law, and a commentary to it. Um, and, um, and, and, uh, you know, well, that's basically it, actually. That's more or less what you had. But they did have these, uh, these, these works. You had marriage registries. Interestingly, you had an Eruv, right? What does an Eruv do? What's the point of an Eruv? Right, to transport items on Shabbat. The biblical law is that you're not allowed to transport things in a public domain on Shabbat. However, there is a means of merging all the properties within the domain. You create a boundary around it, and you have a joint meal that is accessible to all the people who live within it. And now they are considered to all be inhabitants of one area via this thing called the Eruv. Well, take a look at source number eight. A rabbi from that Pardo, fa Pardo family. I have been corrected. It's Pardo, not Pardo. The, uh, in Curacao, Rabbi Josiah Pardo arrived toward the end of the 17th century and established an Eruv to allow carrying on Shabbat. So they actually had that. There's also something else that's interesting here. Take a look. There, too, in Source 8, according to a witness in 1825, the Sephardic planters followed, quote, a number of religious laws relative to agriculture and cattle breeding, and so doing lost a part of the produce of their plantations, and what they're talking about here is tithing. The, um, not in terms of the agriculture. You only tithe plants that are Israeli. Um, however, you do have certain practices about gleanings and the like, which will apply and not mixing species, which may have applications outside of the land of Israel. But then look at what comes next. Young planters chasing runaway slaves in the forests took the time to conduct morning and evening prayers. 
even while visiting a maroon village in 1761. We're going to come back to that next week, to that story. It's a fascinating story. In October 1774, the Parnassim at Yodin Savannah gathered to deal with the case of Joseph Homan Pinto, who had apparently ordered his slaves and workers to work on the Sabbath. So they weren't supposed to have them working on the Sabbath. They were supposed to be, to be resting. Very interesting. But the extent of their observance really isn't clear. On the one hand, we have everything we've talked about. We even have letters that show that they imported kosher food, like cheese and beef, from Europe. I'm not sure I would eat that, frankly, after all that time, but I guess they did. Um, But on the other hand, um, the Scottish mercenary by the name of John Gabriel Stedman observed Jews without head coverings and eating pork. He wrote about it. Apparently it was impressive to him. The, um, you had punishments that were issued for violations of Jewish law, like this case that was mentioned in source number eight about the fellow who ordered the slaves to work on the Sabbath, um, indicating that there was a religious authority, but also indicating that not everybody was listening. Right? You wouldn't have needed these cases if everybody was listening. And the answer to this seems to be relatively obvious, right? Some people are more observant than others. The institution as a whole may have been uh, kosher, but not necessarily that all the individuals were, uh, were, were careful. The, um, the key points that I want to take away from this are that there was reasonable Jewish knowledge and freedom. There were Jewish institutions and rabbis. So why were they as engaged in slavery as they were? So it's 1056, but I want to get started on this point, and then it will be clearly the dominant thing for, uh, for next week. Um, there were absolutely were slaves. That we know. If you look at source number nine, you find numbers based on the register of population in 1684, not for the Jews only. So in other words, the entire colony has 4,200 African slaves. In that colony, we have 163 Jews holding almost 1,000 African slaves. So here's my question. What happened between this source and our Baal source in 1694 that we read in source number 5, which has 9,000. And the answer is that when you work with history, you always have to know your sources. His source, our Baal source for the 9,000 number, is the historical essay on the colony of Suriname, which was written in 1788 by that Nasi family I mentioned earlier. And their goal in this essay, at least in part, is to try to build up the Jewish community and talk about how unnecessary they were for the entire colony, how influential they were, and now you start to understand. Your population register of 1684 says that they have a thousand African slaves. There's no way you went from a thousand to nine thousand in ten years' time. That's just not happening. So how is it? The answer is he inflated the number. He's writing a hundred years later, right? He's writing this in 1788. There's no one around to correct him. So he is saying that, yeah, even back then, we were so incredibly influential that we held 9,000 slaves. Mind you, for us today, we look at that and say, well, that's not something to be proud of. No, that's a bad thing. But back in the day, this was a sign of your financial influence. And so that's how you get that 9,000 number. But let's go back to the real number, because we still have to ask ourselves the question, how is it that Jews did this? Why in the world was this an acceptable thing to do? So here, I'm just going to conclude with source number 10. And then we're going to have to um, we're going to have to come back to this. This is from Shorsh's dissertation. Yet Jews made good, kind masters and maintained the loyalty of their blacks, as the term is used there. It's not a term I particularly like, but it's the common term used. According to the authors of the historical essay on Suriname, several pages were devoted to describing the warm reception given to a party of Jews chasing runaways from the La Para plantation. This is that 1761 quote that we had before about Jews be, um, praying when they were chasing slaves. They visited a village of the Juca Maroon with whom a peace treaty had just been signed. 
These runaways from Jewish homes, quote, entertained these Jews in every possible way, and each, uh, and each one hastened to lavish foodstuffs upon them and to offer them as a mark of unlimited affection their own wives and daughters. I don't even know what that means. The, um, yeah, my reaction is much like the one that you just had, Susan. The, um, the part of this is likely an exaggeration from the historical essay, again, wanting to portray the Jews in as positive a light as possible, so they held many slaves, and they also had a, um, and they also had good relations with them, because we're writing our own history, but I want to talk more about this. To a certain extent, they held slaves because, as Anne wrote, they, um, they needed them to make a profit. And that's for sure a major motivation. But there's more going on here. And that's what I would like to discuss next week. So next week, God willing, we're going to talk about the slave trade and Jewish involvement in it, both in Europe and in the colonies. Yes, it was part of the society, but I think there's more to be said about this. And next week, I also hope to have an announcement about continued classes in in, uh, in July, so stay tuned for that. If you're again, if you didn't get the email and you would like to get the email, um, please make sure that you send me a non. Just adding a note from that tuba of 1643, or allegedly so. I did some research afterwards and wanted to note it here. Um, in 1905, there was a rabbi in Paramaribo who claimed that the Suriname Jewish community must have been there before 1643 because he had found a ketuba from that time that was dated Tuesday the 14th of Elul 5404 and it must have been there for some time before that. That ketuba ends up being triply misdated. Um, first of all, uh, in 1920, there was a Dutch archivist who determined that the copy of the ketubah held at The Hague, the original, um, actually said 5473, which would make it 1713. So that's number one. It's not uh, 540, 5404, but 547, excuse me, not 5473, 5474. That's... Um, leading with something that we're not up to yet. So 5474, and so the archivist said that should be 1713, not 1643. Number two, in 1984, historian Robert Cohn from the University of Haifa published an article that's available online called The Misdated Ketubah, and uh, in that article, he supported the Dutch historian by noting the Ketubah came from Chacham Me'atob, who is on record as participating in weddings as late as 1724, which means he would have to be fairly old um, in order to have done that. Could be, but more likely the ketubah was simply from 17, you know, from, from 1713, not from 1643, he said. He also noted that the date as originally presented, 14th of Elul 5404, would have been a Shabbos, not a Tuesday. So it's now doubly misdated. Number one, the year is wrong, and number two, the day the um, the day of the week would be wrong if you were really following the uh, five four zero four dating. Okay, but during my class, uh, somebody noted to me that actually everyone here is discussing the original date of sixteen forty three, um, but it wouldn't have been. It would have been sixteen o. Well, I'm yeah, sorry. It would have been sixteen forty four. Right, because the year five four zero Elul in the year five four zero four would have been sixteen forty four, not sixteen forty three, um, which means that the correct date is not seventeen thirteen, but seventeen fourteen. Um, I, I would note that um, that the original Rabbi Ru, Rabbi Rus of uh, Paramaribo, who found the document. Um, and wrote his article, probably understood 1644, when he said that the Jewish community must have been there for some time before the wedding, um, he meant that they would have been there um, in 1643 for the wedding to be held in 1644. Um, but it seems like everybody after him assumed that he was dating it in 1643, and they just went with that. So they said not 1643, but 1713, when in fact they should have been saying um, 1714. Okay, I hope that's somewhat clear. Be well.